It's a story that would go on to change the world, but it happened so long ago that we forget. You know, the same way you can forget what you got last Christmas. And yet here we are, the same thing year after year. We decorate, we rush, we shop, we wrap, we open, we invite, we attend, we eat, we celebrate, we box it all up, wait 12 months, and we do it again. But there's more to the story, more than a tree, more than gifts, and more than just another holiday. And we all want there to be more to this season. The thing is, God knew that. In fact, that was his plan all along. He wants us to have more, more joy, more peace, more of him. He gave us the perfect gift, and it wasn't wrapped neatly under a tree. The gift he gave wasn't a virgin mother or wise men. It wasn't angels, a star, or a manger. The gift he gave was and is the person of Jesus, fully God, but completely human. The gift was that he clothed himself in humanity and embarked on a rescue mission, one that would give hope to all mankind. And the story that would change the world forever began like this. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. We are about to cover some un- chartered territory for a lot of you because I know what you do because I do it too. <laughs> I know that when you get to genealogies in scripture, when you get to a bunch of list of names, you're just like, huh, I'm not reading that. I'll go ahead and skip on, right? As soon as you see Matthew chapter one, verse one, like if you are starting a, a New Testament reading program or whatever, you're just like, well, I'll skip on to verse 18. You know, let's go ahead and get to that story because a lot of times we think that, you know, who cares? It's just a bunch of names. You know, we, we don't know who they are, and we don't know really what happened, and yeah, it's great. He's got parents, you know. Jesus had uh, descendants and so forth before him, or not descendants, but he had, he had people before him that uh, led to him coming, and so it's not really all that important. And so when you get to, like, for instance, First Chronicles chapter 1 through 9, it's all names. Like, who wants to read all names? Seriously. And so today, what I really want to challenge you with is hopefully you'll be informed because there's a lot of information that's about to come at you. But on the other side, I really just want you to take the principle of this. Scripture is filled with treasure, but it's not for the lazy. Right? The nuggets of John 3.16 immediately hit you. You love it. It's sweet in your mouth, and it's beautiful. But there's so much more. And what I'm saying to you is this. Every time you go into the Word of God, ask the Holy Spirit, help me to receive truth from your Word. Because it is what? It's equipping us to be godly men and women so that we can live a life according to what God has called us to. Correct? So it's equipping us, but it's also, we need the power to do it. How many times have you known what to do and yet have chosen otherwise and then hated yourself for it on the next day or something, right? We need the power to actually carry out the truth that God has revealed to us. And so we're asking for a couple of different things. And before I even get started, I want to go ahead and say this. Congratulations to the Logan Sport Tigers. What, what, right? Way to go, guys. I don't know if any, I know we had some Logan Sport people in here in the first service, but that's just really cool for our parish. I mean, we've had, what, softball state champs, uh, Baseball champs, now we've got football champs. I mean, it's, it's all kinds of cool stuff going on. There'll be a movie, no doubt. Hallmark will have one. Four or five years from now, they're going to have some people playing out there. It's going it's to be really cool. So we're glad about all that stuff. We're in this series for Christmas. I'm really happy about that because it's been a few years since I've gotten to do one that really focused in. And so I'm about to read a list, and I promise you this. I will butcher a few of the names, so forgive me. The other side of this equation is this. Your eyes are going to glaze over as I read this. You're going to be like... Oh my goodness. But here's the thing. I'm about to show you some treasure from it. And so I hope you have a pen so you can write some of the notes down because there's going to be a lot of stuff in here. The first verse, which we start with, literally is enough to do the whole message on. Uh, there's a lot right there, but I'll go ahead and start. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, 12 tribes of Israel, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, or Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Wow, y'all should be impressed, right? 
Okay, it gets a little harder. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. That's a red flag. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jothan. And Jothan, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manah. I cannot say that word. Manah. Okay, we'll skip it. Okay, and he was the father. You don't know who he is anyway. And he was the father of Amos. And Amos was the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconia. And Jeconia and his brothers. And at the time of the deportation of Babylon. Okay, so we're almost there. And after the deportation to Babylon... Uh, Jeconia, the father of Shiltia, and Shiltia, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abed, Abi, Abiad, Abiad, and Abiad, the father of Elikim, and Elikim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Matna, and Matna, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is the Christ. Wow, okay. Yeah. So all the generations, verse 17, from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. And that is the word of the Lord. Okay. I only butchered like two names, so I did, I did better than in the first service. I'm getting, I'm getting at this. So think about this. Your eyes just glazed over as you read this, but how did he start it, okay? He said, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of what? Abraham, the son of David. He's over here saying, not once upon a time in a very far land away. He does not begin it as fairy tales. You see, so many people take Christmas and say, that's a good, that's a good fairy tale, and it's got a beautiful story, and it, it's all about, you know, how we can feel warm and fuzzy around the campfires, and, and how we can have the kumbaya, and if we all hold hands and the world will be better and that's not what it says he says that Jesus was really born and when you look at Luke he says that he was really born during the time of Caesar Augustus and he says it's really during the time of Quirinius the governor and he, he names specific dates and he, he goes into detail and he doesn't just say well he was born to such and such he goes through this whole genealogy you see Matthew check this out I'll go in order. Mark was more than likely the first gospel that was written, recorded, okay? So Mark starts out with, this is the beginning of the Jesus uh, of the ministry of Jesus. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Okay, well, Matthew's probably the second one to be written. He says, this is the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He goes all the way back to Abraham. Luke comes in here. He's probably the third one written, most likely. He comes in there and he says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, and he goes all the way reverse, goes all the way to Adam, right? He brings him all the way back to Adam, and then John, he, I think he's a one-upper. You know, he comes back later, about between probably 90 to 95 A.D., writing in his old age. He writes the Gospel of John. John 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He takes us all the way back to eternity. Okay, so you see what's happening here. He's saying this. You cannot look at Jesus, no matter if you say you're an atheist or say you're agnostic or just say you're a skeptic. You can't just say, well, Jesus, I don't really think he was ever born historical secular records say that he was born. And they also, in particular, say that he was what? Crucified under Pontius Pilate. We have rec records outside of the Bible that he was crucified, okay? Jesus is not a fairy tale. Jesus is not a good wish on you getting gifts on Christmas Eve. You see what I'm saying? Like, Jesus was historically founded, born, lived the perfect life, died for our sins on the cross as a thief, and rose from the grave. And it says, how many people saw him? Just one, just two, no. At one point in time, over 500 people saw him. And Paul said when he was writing it that almost all of those people were still alive, okay? Now, how many of y'all know in a court of law that you only need two good witnesses? Really just one, but honestly, two good witnesses to go ahead and help convict someone. Jesus said that he had over 500. Paul's telling, talking about Jesus. Okay, Jesus was not a once upon a time story. The gospel is not advice. It's good news because we're in a bad place, Okay. Like we said last week, if you didn't, weren't here for the message, check it out. But it, we talked about the fact that darkness has seen a great light. Jesus is that light shining into the darkness of the world. And so I want you to take this down with me for taking notes. God is faithful. Come on now with me. God is faithful to fulfill his promises. God's 
faithful to fulfill his promises. How many of y'all have ever been preparing for something? For instance, moms out there, dads do a little bit, but it's mostly the moms preparing for a baby, right? I mean, when you're preparing for a baby to come, I mean, it's not just like 40 weeks flies up and then all of a sudden, oh, wow, I got to go to the hospital. It's not like that. Like, as soon as you know that you're pregnant, you begin thinking about it, you begin dreaming about it. Is he going to be a doctor? Is he going to be a lawyer? Is he going to be a, a, you know, a florist? Or what is he going to do? You know, who's he going to be? Or who's she going to be? And what are they going to do? And I'm already praying for their, their husband or their wife. You know what I'm saying? Or I'm praying for the grandkids and the other grandkids. Like, you're jumping ahead of them. You're planning out their future, if you will. How can I be a good parent? How many of y'all were scared when you first had your kids? You know, you're, how many of y'all drove down the highway? You're more dangerous when you drive with your first kid because you're like going 30 miles an hour in a 65 zone. You're like, stop it! Everybody's going so fast! You know, it's like the second kid, you don't care. <laughs> you don't care. You're just flying. You're like, they got seat belts. They're good to go. Second kid changes everything. You really just don't. I do care. I see how y'all are looking. I do care about my kids. I'm just a little rough with them. So when you have a baby coming, what about planning a house? How many of y'all ever built a house from scratch? I mean, that's a lot of fun. It's, it's a headache too, but it's a lot of fun. Because you don't just go out there, and I know some of y'all are some really good, you know, manly men, and, and maybe women, women, whatever. And you go out there, and you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, and you buy some wood, and you throw it together, and hit a few nails, and voila, you got a house. That's just not how it really works, though. You know, you, you go and look at plans, and you go and say, you know what, what if, what if I had this room, and I had this room, and how many square, f- you know, what's the square footage going to be like, and, and if this is my last home, I don't want my bedroom to be upstairs, because I might not have to be able to go upstairs when I'm, you know, 80, 90, or whatever years old, so I'm, I'm thinking through if I haven't had kids, I'm thinking through having kids and what will it look like to have them around? What kind of space do I want to have for the table? You know, do I want to have meals together with my kids? You know, do I want to set that up? Or do I want to have an open kitchen or a closed off kitchen? You know, what do I want to do? And so you go and look at other people's houses. You go through and you plan all these things. And then you still got to find a contractor. And then you still got to find an architect or someone to draw it. And then it still is going to take anywhere from six to eight months, depending on what you're doing, right? I mean, it takes a long time, especially to set that foundation. So it's a time of preparation, a time of planning. Erica's sister, she's getting married in March, and so she's excited, right? She's pumped up about getting married and being a beautiful bride, and so she's planning out who to invite, you know, and and what to get and what kind of flowers and where is it going to be at and what kind of food are you going to eat and is it going to be too much food or is it going to be too little food and what kind of budget do we have to work with and all that. Right? It's planning. See, it had been a very, very, very long time Since Abraham had been promised that through his seed, not through all of his sons, but through his seed, through the promised one, Isaac would be born the Messiah. It had been over 2,000 years. Now listen, some of y'all are saying, God, you're not coming through for me. God, I've been praying about this for a long time. God's time is not your time. God's on a whole different playing field, and you got to begin to understand that God is God and you are not. You can't dictate and you can't control him. He's not a tame God like that. It says in Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. I want you to look at that word, fullness of time. There's two words in the Greek. I told you I'm giving you a mouthful today. There's two words in the Greek for time. One of those is chronos, and that's the word that's used here. In the fullness of time, at the right second, At the right minute, on the right hour, on the right day, on the right month, at the right time in history, 2,000 years almost since he promised it to what? Abraham, almost 1,000 years since he promised it to David, God sends forth his son born unto a what? Virgin, Mary. Miraculous, impossible other than God himself has done such a thing. So he says when the fullness of time had come, now Romans 5, 6 says it a little differently. Romans 5, 6 says this, For while we were still weak, that means unable to save ourselves, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Well, what's the right time? Kairos. Kairos in the Greek means the opportune moment. Have you ever had someone say something to you that just meant the world to you and they had no clue because they said it at the right moment? And at the right time. You ever been in that situation where maybe you had a flat on your your vehicle and you did not have the tools to be able to change it? Maybe you just didn't have the know-how to change it. And that person at the right time and at the right moment came behind you, pulled up, shined their lights on it, said, I'd love to help you. I'd love to change that tire. You see what I'm saying? At the right time. You see, God invaded history at the right second, but also at the right moment. You see, there's a difference between time Minutes and moments. There's a big difference between the two. And so God is saying, I came and I sent my son at the right time. Because I said in verse 1, who is he? He's the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was promised 
a child when he was 75 years old, and that was not fulfilled until he was 100. Are y'all with me here? We get mad when it takes more than five minutes to get our sandwiches in the drive through line. You know what I'm saying? And he's over here praying and says, Lord, you're going you're gonna to provide me with a son. Hallelujah, right? I mean, he's excited about that, but yet 25 years. 25 years. Moses, the great savior of the, of the Israeli people, he felt the calling of God on his life at 40. We can tell because of what he did because he was rich. Everything that the world tells you that you need, that's what Moses had. He was rich. He was well-educated. He was part of the royal family at that point in time. He could have any woman that he wanted. He had everything, and yet he still said, I can see the Messiah ahead, it tells us in Hebrews, that he saw something greater ahead, and so he forsook his stately position and went out there and said, my brothers are being enslaved, and he fought for him, ended up killing an Egyptian. Follow me with the story. Kills an Egyptian ends up fleeing for his life into the land of Midian and goes from being this higher up big shot to a shepherd. Shepherds were not looked upon as they were like amazing guys. I mean, they were just like, in some cases, they were kind of the low of the low, if you will. God had to rid him of all of his ability and all of his pride and all of his, I can do this on my own. And it took 40 years to bring him to the humble state where he said, I can't even speak. Like, don't, let, don't tell me to go save the people of Israel. You should have done it 40 years ago. And here's the deal. God is not looking for the able. God makes you able. Come on with me. I know y'all aren't some charismatic folks in here, but God is not looking for the able. God is looking for the heart. God is looking for the heart that is directed towards him. God's looking for the heart that says, I don't know how you're going to do it, Lord, but I'll go. Send me. God is looking for that heart because he can do the impossible through you. Now, I want you to think about this, too. On David's side, he had promised David. David said, I'm going to build you a house, Lord. And the Lord said, you're not building me a house because your hands are covered in blood. You're a man of war. Your son can build me a house, but you can't build me a house. But here's what I'll do for you. I will build you an eternal house, and I will make your son to sit on the throne. The lineage of David will reign forever and ever and ever and ever. And who was he speaking about? Jesus Christ, right? But it took a thousand years for Jesus to even come, and he didn't come as a ruling and reigning king. He came as a baby. He came as a lamb, not as a lion. Yet he was a lion. But he was meek, and he was kind. And just to go ahead and further that notion, from Malachi, when you change, turn a few pages back in your Bible... You have a 400-year gap from the last time that God spoke, thus saith the Lord kind of language, from the last time God spoke to the people of Israel. So I want you to think about this. If you were thinking that God was going to fulfill his promise, you would probably be at this point in time, God, are you not only not fulfilling your promise, but are you going backwards on it? Like, are you moving in the opposite direction of where you've called me to? Like, God, you're supposed to do this in this way or in that way, and God, you're not fulfilling your promise. And here's what Paul says in Titus 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. God never lies. What does it say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9? He says, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day unto the Lord. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus has been gone, and I don't know about y'all, but my heart longs to see our Lord return. Like I'm, I'm, I long with John in Revelation 20, it says, come Lord Jesus, come, right? Do you have those days? I hope you at least have those moments. Uh, having some of those moments, you're like, Lord, come back. Lord, come and save this place. Lord, come and and take away the wickedness. And Lord, redeem me and give me the resurrected body you've promised me. I'm, I'm longing for you to come. We long for that, don't we? We long to see the Lord coming back. We long to see it. And what does he say in here in verse 9? He says, If the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. He's patient toward you so that none might perish, but all would come into repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You see, our God is a good God. He's a wise God. But here's what I want you to begin to look at. God's timing is not your timing. Can I get an amen this morning? God's timing is not your timing. He's not on your table. He's not on your time frame. Listen, you have your ways, and God says, I have my ways. Here's another part I want you to think about, too. God does it far exceedingly and abundantly greater than you would have imagined in the first place. Have you ever tried to give God advice? I mean, think about that for a second. Have you, have you ever told God, I want you 
Lord, I'm going to be patient, right? I mean, I'm a patient, I'm a reasonable person, Lord, so I'm going to wait on you, I'm going to wait, I'm going to be patient, but I'm going to tell you how you should do it. Have you ever told the Lord, and, and I'm just saying through your prayers about how they should change somebody, Come on now, come on. Do y'all have any people within your family or extended family that you would say the Lord needs to just be like, you need to be praying for those people, right? They're a little crazy. Throw a hand up for a second. Throw a hand up for a second. All right, if your hand wasn't up, y'all look around. Y'all might be talking about somebody here this morning. Think about this for a second. He's over here saying that, listen, he does it in a way that we would not have imagined because we're always saying, God, I want you to do it in this way. And God, I think you should do it in that way. And God, I think you should show up at this time. And the Lord's saying, I'm not on your time frame, and I don't do it the way that you would do it. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this, For my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Is that, is that enough for you to sit with? He's saying, my ways, they're, they're not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. That's powerful stuff to keep in mind. And I want to say this too. He always supersedes what we imagine that he would do. You ever notice that? Not only does he not do it the way we thought he was going to do it, but he always supersedes the way in which we would have done it. How many times have you ever wanted to get back at someone, and if you would have done exactly what you said you wanted to do, it would have not only been a broken relationship that might have echoed down through generations. Like, think about this. Your actions, you're like, well, they don't really matter. No, they do matter. How many of y'all are still holding a grudge, or you still think that someone's family is no good for nothing simply because of what someone did 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, and you're putting someone else's past on them today? And some of y'all are like, well, that's not me. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We do that with cultures. We, we do that with different cultures because of things that happened back in World War II or the Vietnam War or World War I. You know, we, we put that on entire cultures, and you're telling me we don't do it to people? Yes, we do. We do put that on there. And so God does things in ways in which you would have never have imagined in the first place. Because here's what a lot of people say. You know, if God just would have come in and wiped out all the wicked people, it would have been great. If he wiped out all the wicked people, we wouldn't be here today. Because, see, we think that we're pretty good, but Jesus in Matthew 7 says, you can give good gifts, but yet your fathers are wicked. That's a blanket statement, okay? If God truly wiped out all of the wicked, all of those who are not perfect, that's what God calls for. You have to be perfect from start to finish. We'd all be gone. Other people say that I wish he would have come in as a conquering king. Listen, if God said that we needed a politician, he would have sent a politician that could have brought in a political system. If God said that if the economy would have been better, he would have brought an economist. If God said that we could wipe out diseases, that would have made everything better, he would have sent a doctor. No, he said, the problem is you have no relationship with me because you are dead in your sins and your trespasses and you need a savior. And so therefore he sent us Jesus the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. And we can sing a hallelujah with Paul when he says in Romans 11, 33, oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. Do y'all notice in this first verse, I want to read it one more time. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That sentence right there for a lot of us is just like, yeah, of course, he's Jesus. You know, a lot of Americans and maybe some of y'all today think that Christ is his last name. It's not. It's a title. In the Old Testament, Christ was Messiah, which was another way to say anointed. This was the anointed one of the Lord. This was the long-promised one of the Lord. Now, check this out for a second. For us, because we're always surrounded by Christianese, right, we just think, ah, yeah, Jesus Christ, great. Great guy. Did some amazing things. Saved me. For these people, this was 2,000 years in the making. This was 1,000 years in the making for the Davidic king to come. This was 400 years of utter silence of God speaking to them. And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when the first promise was given, this was thousands of years of promise waiting. Now listen to me. How many of y'all are excited possibly about what you might get for Christmas and you're only waiting a few weeks or a few months These people have been waiting millennia for the promised Savior of the world. He changed history as we know it when he came into this world. I just want you all to know that because I know it's not really ringing a bell, but I just want you to begin to say, okay, there's more to it than just that. All right, number two is this. The gospel turns upside down what the world values. The gospel turns down upside down what the world values. I want you to think about this. The genealogy of Jesus' day 
I told you it was a lot of information, but the genealogy of Jesus' day was a resume. How many of y'all have ever filled out a resume for a job? If you've ever gotten a job, more than likely you've probably filled out a resume. On a resume, what do we like to do? We like to put a highlight reel, right? Like if you watched, uh, I didn't watch the game, I didn't go down there for uh, the Logan Sport, but you can watch like uh, Channel 3 has like a three-minute highlight reel, and so I got to watch the entire game in three minutes, right? Touchdown, 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 interception, touchdown, touchdown, we win, right? And so it's like a highlight reel, and that's exactly what a genealogy was. A genealogy was a highlight reel of all of the pedigree of Jesus, right? Think about this for a moment. If you have a son or if you have a daughter, how many of y'all want them to be a part of a family that has been known to be thieves and robbers for the last three generations, God, y'all are horrible parents. Um, seriously, like, do y'all want that? The answer, of course, is no. Like, I don't want my child because whether you believe it or not, young men or young women out there, when you marry that person, you're marrying their family, and you're also marrying who they're probably going to end up being a lot like. So you better figure out if you like that mother or you like the father, okay, because they're going to be a lot like them in some form, some fashion. Think about this just for a moment when you, when you consider some of the things being said here. Here is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and there are a lot of things in there that honestly just look out of place. For instance, if you turn in a resume and you've had a few bad jobs here and there, what would you do? You'd probably skip a few years, right? You'd probably, some of y'all are laughing. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I would skip. 96 to 98, you know, I took a sabbatical. Not really working so much. It really, because you don't want to talk about what? The bad job and the bad experience and the bad boss who can't actually tell you this because they'll get sued. They can't tell you how sorry, you know, of a job you did. They have to say, I would not rehire that person. You know, that's the legal way of doing it. But I want you to think for a moment how people fudge on the resumes. For instance, I used to wash dishes at my parents' place. And, uh, and so I, I could have been like a dishwasher. But would I put that on my resume? No, I'd probably put this, hydraulic H2O cleaning service specialist. You know, I mean, have you ever known people that honestly put some like crazy stuff? And you're like, you wash dishes, man. Like, why don't you just put that you wash dishes? Because we want to make everyone sound better than they are. Matthew did the opposite of that. When you look through the genealogy of Jesus, you're going to notice if you read some of the Old Testament genealogies, Matthew has chosen specific names so that he could numerically get the number 14, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So it's not exactly like he's not skipping a few names. He numerically purposely did 14 and 14 and 14 to Jesus. So he's picking and choosing. But here's the other part that's weird. In our day, it's not weird. In Jesus' day, it was strange. Very few genealogies had women in it. Okay, he had five ladies' names, including Mary's name, but four of which were Old Testament women. Here's the crazy part. Most of these women had some seriously uh, strange situations surrounding them. Sexual uh, immorality mainly being one of those. Okay, so he's including these people in his list. Rather than omitting them, he's including them. And so look with me in your scripture real quick when you have Matthew open. In verse number three, what does he say? And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah. So why does he name Zerah? He's not even the father of, of the next guy down the line. And he says, who was the mother? By Tamar. Why did he name Tamar? Well, read Genesis chapter 38. What does Genesis chapter 38 say? It says that basically in a nutshell, you check it out on yourself. Tamar was upset with her father-in-law, Judah, because he had given her two sons. Both of those sons had been killed by the Lord because they were wicked people. He had promised her a third son that you know, she would be able to have children through. He would not give his third son. His wife had died. He goes into this town, and she realizes what he has done. She puts on a garment and veils her face, and she looks like a cult prostitute. He ends up coming up to her and says, hey, I'd like to have sex with you. And she's like, well, not she's not like that. Y'all are looking at me like that. She, she says, yes. And she says, what will you give me? And he says, well, I'll give you a goat. And she says, well, what are you going to give me to show me that you'll give me the goat later on? And so he gives his signet ring, which is his authority. He gives his cloak and he gives his staff. And so he ends up having sex with her. He ends up having incest. Okay, y'all getting that? Incestual relationship. He ends up having twins with her. And so it comes to find out that she's pregnant after three months. He says, let's stone her and then bone, uh, uh, burn her. And then from there, <laughs> we're going to have to edit that one. <laughs> that came out wrong. I did not mean to say <laughs> close to what that sounded like I was about to say. <laughs> we played a game last night called Speak Out. <laughs> and it opens your mouth up and you have to say words and you can't say them. And anything that starts with a W or a B, you can't say it. And so 
that was the B word that I was trying to get to, and you couldn't say it. And so <laughs> he said, let's stone her and burn her. <laughs> That's scriptural. <laughs> Other part, not so much. And uh, anyway, she says, whose ring? <laughs> Y'all are not going to be able to go through the rest of the message. Whose ring and whose staff is this? And, uh, and he's like, oh, man, I got caught. I've done something bad. She's more righteous than I am. And, and so she has the kids. So what is Matthew doing? He's not an idiot. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's a scribe. He's smart, right? He was, he was part of the Jewish tax collect, collection system, but he was a smart guy. And so he wrote this on purpose to bring up what? The scandalous history of Jesus the Messiah. He's bringing up the facts. So some of y'all come out here and you're like, man, I have a really messed up family line. Well, listen to it. Jesus did too, and he's the Messiah. You think that some of the bad stuff that's going on in your world can change up what God's going to do for you. Listen, that's not true. The power of God, the grace of God, the blood of Jesus Christ overcomes all your sin and all of your past. But you've got to believe in his name. And so he could have edited it out, but he gives us this highlight reel. And then think about the second person he names. He names Rahab. What was Rahab? What did she do? She was a prostitute. Okay, I'm getting some of y'all church people to blush. Like, we have a prostitute in the line of the lineage of Jesus, and she's in the mix of it, and she's brought in there. And then the next person is Ruth, and Ruth was a pretty good girl. But here's the other part. She was a Moabite, and the Moabite, according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, she had no business whatsoever to the 10th generation and forever to be in the assembly of God. Like, she was not supposed to be with the people of God. And yet she was through the lineage of what? Of David, which was through the Christ. Okay, y'all getting with me on this story? Some of y'all are like, y'all are getting a little too much information. I'm with you. Look at this in verse 6. Verse 6, he says, And Jesse, the father of David, he goes further though, because a lot of these people after David are kings. He does this, the king. David was the greatest king Israel had ever known. He was the most righteous king Israel had ever known, except what you're about to read. And it said right after that, second half of the verse, And David was the father of Solomon by... Bathsheba? It doesn't say that, though. It does not say Bathsheba. It says, by the wife of Uriah. Immediately, he is pulling into the reader's mind for those who are educated on what has happened in the Old Testament history. He is saying that David, the one who took, Bash- I mean, took Uriah's wife Bathsheba, had sex with her, had a child with her, had Uriah murdered and sent to the front line of battle. It is through Solomon that God brought forth the Messiah. Are y'all, y'all with me on this? Y'all tracking with me on this? So what God is saying is he's bringing in all of these people. And if you notice too, and I'm not going through this, but the kings that are named... In Judah, on the southern tribe, about 60% of the kings were bad and about 40% of them were decent. On the northern 10 tribes, about 80% were bad and about 20% were good. And so think about this for a moment. It does not matter what is in your past record. You can't stop the work of God. You're not that powerful. You're not that clever. And we're sure not that smart. God's will comes through. His promises are fulfilled. Amen and amen. It is so cool when you begin to look at this. Why is he putting these names in here? Because whether it's the righteous King David, I want to say this to you. It doesn't matter how righteous you think you are. You are still guilty of sin. You still need salvation. You still need Jesus' blood to cover your sins so that you can live forevermore. Or whether you're as bad as someone who has had incest and has prostitution and all the other stuff in your past background, the blood of Jesus covers you. Y'all see what he's doing? He's taking the spectrum of the greatest and the most righteous to the spectrum of the most wicked and the lowest. And he's saying this, all at the foot of the cross must come and bow the knee. You see, so many of us, we, we think that it takes a certain type of person or a certain education or a certain background to be able to come to Jesus and you've missed the whole point. You've, you've missed the whole point. Because if you think you're good enough to come to Jesus, you've just excluded yourself from being able to come to Jesus. So much happens when we allow pride to well up in our hearts that keeps us from the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does all this mean? If you're taking the notes, these little subpoints in here, the excluded and the marginalized are included in the family of Jesus. The excluded and the marginalized are included in the family of Jesus. Because we're taught whether explicitly or implicitly, to look down upon people. We're taught that. 
Um, and whether your family ever did that, and they might have been a very welcoming family, or whether it was simply uh, what you were surrounded by, we're taught to. Think about this just for a moment. The educated are taught to look down on the uneducated, and the uneducated are taught to look down on the snobby educated. Think, you think? The people who are rich are taught to look down on those who are poor, and the people who are poor are taught to be angry at those who are rich because somehow or another they're all wicked, evil people. The people who have one political leaning are taught to hate the other people who have another political leaning that must be stupid, right? We're taught to think that. The people who have white skin or black skin or yellow skin or red skin or whatever it is, we're taught that we're to be superior to the other people because we're all different. Think about this for a moment. Like that's something that is ingrained within us. And what does Jesus say? He says, I don't care who you are or where you come from or how smart you think you are, how rich you think you are, or whatever it is, at the foot of the cross, the plain is leveled. John the Baptist said it well. He says, I have come to bring the mountains low and to raise the valleys up to make straight the way of the Lord. And that's exactly what it is. At the foot of the cross of Jesus, we all come as sinners. We all come united. And when we leave the cross, go ahead, y'all with me on this one. We all leave as family. I want y'all to notice these two tables right here. At the time of Jesus, they would not have had these individual cups. We're all worried about each other's germs right now. At the time of Jesus, we would pass one cup. And it would all be one loaf. Because we're all one family. Do y'all get that? When Jesus came, he defeated the walls of hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles, which hated each other. He breaks down for those who allow that to take place in their lives, the hostility between man and woman, which was part of the curse all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Like, Jesus is here. He brings peace. But he also brings division for those who hate light and love darkness. Second point is this. The good people and the bad people can only be saved by grace. The good people and the bad people can only be saved by grace. And third, Jesus is not, this is so good, ashamed to call us family. Jesus is not ashamed to call us family. How many of y'all can name your great, great, great grandfather? And you don't have to say it out loud, but how many of y'all can do that? Most of y'all can't. And I'm not just saying grandfather, great, great grandfather, grandmother on both sides of the family. How many of y'all can do that? Great, great, great. How many of y'all can do that? In a hundred years, you're going to be more than likely either a small memory on a photograph or a video, depending on how that all works out, or forgotten altogether. We just read, even though your eyes glazed over, a bunch of names, right? Why are we reading those names 2,000 years and some of which are 4,000 years old? Why are we reading those names? It's all because of the one they're connected with. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of what he's done. It's all because it's not just a historical event. It's history being made every single day for he rules and he reigns at the right hand of God. If you want your name to go on forever, know the one who gives eternal life. Give your life to Jesus. Jesus is not ashamed to call us family. He looks at us and he says, these are my brothers and my sister and my mother. And last is this, and and the first group, they didn't think this was as cool as I did, so I'll say it, and then we'll end. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment of eternal rest. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment of eternal rest. Matthew 11, 28 says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a beautiful verse, isn't it? Maybe you've never heard it before. Maybe you've heard it a million times. It's still beautiful. How many of y'all stopped working physically after you came to know Jesus? I haven't. You know, I, I, I work a lot. I mean, a lot of y'all work a lot. I mean, how, how many of y'all physically stopped laboring? You know, how, how many of y'all just stopped, even, even if you stopped laboring at your job, how many of y'all had to stop going to the grocery store? None. My wife yesterday, I don't know if that was a cruel joke or if she was mad at me, she sent me to town on Yuri Drive. Do you know what that's like? I don't know if she thought the fruit of the Spirit and patience was lacking in me, but I'm telling you, like, there's something wrong with people. They don't know when to go, so I cut them off. You know, I just go. 
I did, sweetly, though. I didn't do it rude. But Jesus was not talking about physical rest. He was talking about what? Spiritually. Talking about the rest that I can have in my heart that says that no matter what happens to me today or any of my tomorrows, my great tomorrow, my other day, my final day of rest is secured in the name of Jesus because that he has been resurrected. Like I don't have to worry about my tomorrows because they're in the hand of the Father and the Father doesn't let us go. There's more to it than that. I want you to think about this. Why, if he didn't do it completely chronologically in order perfectly, did he choose 14 generations? He did 14 generations, he did 14 generations, he did 14 generations. 14 symbolically, numer numerically, stands for David. Okay, and I know this is not where most people go with this stuff, but I want you to think about this. 14 numerically is the number in which the name of David signifies, but here's another part. 14 is what? Divide it by two. What's 14? Seven. In the Bible, numbers are important. Why do you hear a bunch of numbers in the Old Testament? Because they're there for a reason. How come you hear 40 what? 40 days in the land of promise. Then there were 40 years wandering through the wilderness. And Jesus did what? 40 days in the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. The Israel of the Old Testament couldn't overcome. The true Israel who came overcame. Okay, numbers are important, whether it's 10, whether it's 12, whether it's 6. How many of you ever heard of the number 666, right? Revelation 13. Okay, the number of the beast, the mark of what? Man, imperfection. But what is 7? Genesis chapter 2. What does it say? The Lord did what on the seventh day? He rested. He tells man in Exodus, he says to the people of Israel, he says, you are to work six days, and then on the seventh day you are to do what? Rest. He says you are to have six years of labor, and on the seventh year is to be a sabbatical year. You are to allow the land to rest, and you will have enough in your harvest, enough in your barns, enough in your vat. And then he said this, he goes even further. He says there will be seven sevens, and then on the fiftieth year, the year of Jubilee, shall be a rest of not only the land and not only the people, but you shall forgive all of the debts. Okay? You shall forgive all of those who owe you anything. You shall release the slaves. Right? It's to be the great year of everything to be released so that freedom and accounts are settled and everything is good to go. What do you get here? Here, I'm going to work with me for a second because the last group was like, I don't get that. Maybe you won't. Seven, four, what is it? 14 plus 14 plus 14 equals what? 42. How many sevens are in there? Six times seven equals 42. Jesus is the beginning of the inauguration of the seventh seven. He is the beginning of eternal rest. He is the perfection of the seven. He is the one who inaugurates the kingdom. You can read it all throughout the Gospels. I'm just saying, I believe Matthew is subtly hinting at something right here and bringing us to a place to say, oh my goodness, Jesus is the promised rest that we've all been longing for. Jesus, as it says in Hebrews, is the Sabbath. Jesus is the one in which we have longed for that will give our souls rest. I don't think y'all found that nearly as cool as I did. But to think about that for a moment, it just blows you away that Matthew is weaving in so much right there. And so if we did anything today, I know I gave a lot of information, but I want you to look at God's word and say, there's more. There's more for my situation. There's more for my circumstances. There's more that meets the eye, but I got to search for it. I got to long for God more than I long for food itself. He's got to be my treasure. I'm encouraging some of y'all who never read your Bible to start. Encouraging some of y'all who barely read your Bible to start doing it more. Just a little bit by little bit. Day by day. Verse by verse. Line by line. Give yourself wholly to God. Because his promises remain true and he is a faithful God. And he always, always blows our mind when you think about it. The way he comes through. The way his grace and his mercy. Because I, I want to end on this. Even in the begats. He fathered and he fathered and he fathered. The grace of God and the gospel drip through every single one of those. Every single one of those leads us to understanding that Jesus is truly the king, truly the Messiah. He is our Christmas. He's our everything. If y'all would stand with me this morning, let's pray. I owe to you, Jesus.